In 1932, the Buck Rogers radio program, notable as the first science fiction program on radio, hit the airwaves. It was broadcast in four separate runs with varying schedules. Initially broadcast as a 15-minute show on CBS in 1932, it was on a Monday through Thursday schedule. In 1936, it moved to a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule and went off the air the same year. Mutual brought the show back and broadcast it three days a week from April to July 1939 and from May to July 1940, a 30-minute version was broadcast on Saturdays. From September 1946 to March 1947, Mutual aired a 15-minute version on weekday 623. The radio show again related the story of our hero but finding himself in the 25th century. Actors Matt Crowley, Curtis Arnold, Carl Frank and John Larkin all voiced him at various times. The beautiful and strong-willed Wilma Deering was portrayed by Adele Ronson, and the brilliant scientist inventor Dr. Her was played by Edgar Stelly. The radio series was produced and directed by Carlo D'Angelo and later by Jack Johnstone. Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Buck Rogers is back on the air. Buck and Wilma and all their fascinating friends and mysterious enemies in the super scientific 25th century. This program is brought to you by the makers of Popsicle, Budgicle, and Creamsicle, those delicious frozen confections on a stick. Now I have a swell surprise for you. The famous winner of the typical American boy contest has now become Popsicle Pete. And here's a message from him. Hello, everybody. I sure am glad to meet you. And boy, am I glad I was picked to be the typical American boy. Because now I'm Popsicle Pete. I always wanted to be on the radio. And now I have a chance to tell you about some wonderful presents you can get. Free. Do you want to see them? Hundreds of them. You get them just for saving bags from Nifty Popsicle, Pudgicle, and Creamsicle. Some gifts. Even better than Christmas. You can get a wristwatch, a movie camera, table tennis, a wallet, a doll... Gee, lots of gifts. Just save the bag to pop Popsicle, Creamsicle, and Fudgicle on a handy stick. Boy, did they taste good. Wholesome, too, and nourishing. Made fresh every day of the finest ingredients. The biggest five cents worth anywhere. And say, kids, get the free illustrated Popsicle gift list at your ice cream store. A free coupon comes with it, worth ten bags. And now for Buck Rogers and his thrilling adventures 500 years in the future. As you probably know, Buck was born right here in our own times, in this 20th century. And the story of how he got started on his amazing adventures so far in the future is mighty interesting. But instead of telling you about it, let's turn the dial that'll project us ahead in time and find out all about it that way. Now, the capital of 25th century America is Niagara. And there it is that Dr. Hewer, the great scientist, has his marvelous laboratory. In one room of it, He's working on a strange-looking device that sends a peculiar greenish light down onto a human figure lying on a table before him. Shall we join him there? Okay, then, here we go. 500 years into the future. The ray is putting you to sleep. To sleep. Relax. And sleep. Good. The lace had its effect. Now I can go ahead. Uh, yes, yes, come in. Oh, hello, Wilma. Hello, Dr. Hewitt. Why, why don't you have more light in here? Coming in from outside, I can hardly see a thing in this spooky greenish glow. Part of a little experiment I'm conducting. Oh. But tell me, have you seen anything of Black Barney here in Niagara? Why, no. Hasn't given up his job of prime minister on Mars, has he? Oh, no, no. But one of his Martian rocket ship factories has worked out a new control device for me. I rather hoped he'd get here with it today. Oh. Meantime, I've made ready for a final test of this little invention here. Like to stay and see it? I'd love to, Doctor, and you know it, but I just dropped in to find out if you'd seen any sign. Oh. Uh, what's the matter? Doctor, what's happened to him? Eh? 
Is he all right? Doctor. Oh, I see. What's happened to him? Why is he lying here on the table? Uh, don't worry, Wilma. Don't worry? Doctor, now, what are you... He has offered to be the subject of my test. That's all. But then, well, why he's is he... simply lying here, comfortably asleep, under the influence of my electrohypnotic ray. Oh. I was afraid something had happened to him. Not a thing. Surely you don't think for a minute that I'd do anything No, to... of course not. But the electrohypnotic ray... Are you sure this experiment won't hurt him in any way? Oh, absolutely sure. Well, you can't blame me for being a little shocked for a minute. <laughs> but what's that thing up near his head that looks like a miniature power plant with a loudspeaker on top of it? That, Wilma, is my latest scientific achievement. My newly perfected electro-hypnomentalophone. Your what? Well, you remember the mentaloscope, don't you? Sure. When you put a person under the mentaloscope, all his memory showed up on a sort of moving picture screen. That's right. And this is an adaptation of it. Hmm. With this, the electro hypno mentalophone, the memories of the subject will come to us verbally through the loudspeaker here. Provided, of course, that my calculations have been correct. Hmm. Sort of read a person's mind aloud, you mean? Yes, yes, that's it exactly. Where do you ever get ideas for things like this, Dr. Hewer? Surely people don't just barge in and ask you to work them out. Uh, hardly. <laughs> the scientific research and experimentation that led up to the development of this machine was started way back in the 20th century. Why, I always thought that the people back in the 20th century weren't much better than savages in what they knew about scientific things. Oh, not at all, Wilma. Oh, we owe a great deal to the scientists of those days. Were it not for the groundwork laid by men like uh, Einstein, Fitzgerald, Compton, Millikan, and the rest, Oh, we'd be without a great many of the things we have today. They never really got anywhere with rocket ship development or anything like that, though, did they? Well, successful rocket flight depends on two things that have been brought into existence only recently. One of them must be inertron. Yes, inertron. The material that defies gravity and makes it possible to lift a big spaceship off the Earth and away from its terrific gravitational pull without too much waste of power. And what's the other? Impervium. The only metal capable of withstanding the high temperature of rocket blast for any length of time. Oh. Uh, but now, let's go ahead with this experiment. Yes, let And you can tell me how this apparatus works as we go along. And just what it does to them. Well, not very much to tell you about the apparatus itself, Wilma. Except that here, in this little pad under his head, is an extremely sensitive and high-frequency response piezoelectric oscillator. Of, of quite complicated design. Yes, I, I guess so. Yes. Yeah. And I've succeeded in tuning it to receive the minute electronic impulses that emanate from his brain. Yeah. Through the medium of a super-radiating protoniformer. Oh, yes, I... Oh, what? <laughs> in other words, we're able to obtain sufficient amplification of the impulse output to register audibly through a process of thermionic note magnification. Uh, that's all there is to it. I think I'll understand it better when I see this thing work. <laughs> I should be very much disappointed if it doesn't. Oh, don't you worry about that, Doctor. Your inventions always work. I have been rather lucky in most of my experiments, haven't I? <laughs> lucky? Well, now let's proceed with this one. All right. Anything I can do to help? No, thanks. First of all, we'll have to switch in the electroniformer. Is the electroniformer a sort of eerie sound? Yes. And now, when I switch on this microphone and speak to him... My words will be registered directly on his brain. Not through his ears, you understand, but directly on his brain. Uh-huh. And if we're successful, we'll receive his subconscious response through the loudspeaker. Go ahead, Doctor. Now. Young man, what is your name? I... I said, what is your name? Will my it work? But, Doctor... Yeah, my invention's a success. But, Doctor, what happened? It works even better than I thought it would. He didn't move his lips, though. And how could we hear him talk if he didn't move his lips? He'd read his mind aloud, Will my. He'd read his mind aloud. It sounded like his real voice, though. Well, of course. Because he thinks of speech in the same manner that he utters it. Okay, say it doesn't seem possible. Ask him some more questions. Yes, yes, by all means. Listen. Buck, you were born back in the 20th century, were you not? Yes, sir. See, Wilma, his memory's preserved intact. May I ask him a question? Surely, go ahead. Go ahead. Buck. Buck, how did you happen to come to the 25th century? One day in the year 1919, I was in the lower workings of an abandoned mine near the city of Pittsburgh. Yes? All of a sudden, the supports that held up the walls and ceiling gave way, and the whole thing caved in on me. Yes? Some kind of peculiar gas was released. It put me to sleep. It kept me in a state of suspended animation for 500 years. Then the ground shifted and let in fresh air, and I woke up. Well, how did you know you were in suspended animation? 
Indians for 500 years. Instead of the year 1919, it was the year 24-something. To be exact, it was 24... How did you know what year it was? I was told about it by Lieutenant Wilma Deering, a beautiful girl soldier I met when I first met her. Oh, then you knew uh, Wilma Deering. Oh, I certainly do. (laughs) She's the finest and bravest girl who ever lived. Uh, Buck Rogers? Uh, yes? Uh, did you, um, uh, did you find anything new and different when you first came into the 25th century? Oh, a great deal, thanks to Dr. Hewer. Dr. Hewer? The greatest scientist who ever lived. Uh, what, what, what's this? Nowhere in the universe is there a scientist who's done so much good for humanity, <laughs> or done anything that can even <laughs> no, 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 wait, uh, wait a minute, Buck. Um, yes? Uh, j- just uh, f- forget Dr. Hewer and go on with what you were saying. But he's the man who invented the first rocket ship took us to the moon, and it was that trip that proved the practicability of interplanetary flight. Practicability of interplanetary flight? Nothing wrong with this machine, Doctor. <laughs> uh, where else have you gone by rocket ship, Buck? Uh, first to Mars, where we helped King and Aldo put down an invasion by the Martian Tiger Men. Yes. Then to Saturn and the Saturnian moon, Venus, Jupiter, and yes. even far off Pluto. Which planet did you find most interesting? Well, that's hard to say. Jupiter has the biggest field for exploration simply because it's so much larger than the rest of the planets. Very true. Uh, do you expect to do any more rocketing around through outer space? Well, there's nothing else I'd rather do, sir. Well, Wilma, do you like my little contraption? Oh, it's wonderful, Doctor. I told you it would work. Well, is, uh, is there anything else you'd like to ask, Buck, before I turn off this green ray? Uh-uh. Let's wake him up and see if he remembers anything that happened during the experiment. All right. Go ahead. All right. Come on, Buck. Wake up. Huh? I say, wake up. You've been asleep. Asleep? Uh-huh. Oh, hello, Wilma. Hello. Hey, where'd you come from? What are you doing here? I've just been let in on the test of Dr. Hewer's electro... Uh, uh... <laughs> electro hypno mentalophone. Yeah. Oh, and doggone <laughs> it. Instead of helping you with your test, I fell asleep. Say, I'm awfully sorry, Doctor. Sorry? Oh, yes, sir. I was going to help you. I put you to sleep with this machine. Oh, really? Yeah, right. Oh, I guess that's one on me, then. Uh, how'd it work? Even better than I expected. Oh, good. Oh, it was marvelous, Buck. You told us your whole life history without even opening your mouth. Hey, now, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, oh, it's, it's all right, Buck. You, you didn't say a single thing. You shouldn't have. Oh, thank goodness for that. Uh, let, let's put Wilma under it. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> oh, you have to do something for excitement around here. Come on, Wilma. Oh, you're never satisfied unless there's something exciting going on, are you, Buck? Oh, it's not as bad as all that, Doctor, but... Things have been sort of slow around here lately. And... Wait until we start making tests of the new type of gyrocosmic relativator I've just devised. A new one? Isn't that the equipment on a rocket ship that makes it possible to take off without much loss of time for pickup? That's right. And without the usual physical effects of too quick acceleration. It removes from your ship the normal effects of weight and inertia and momentum and the like. Oh, well, how have you uh, improved the relativator, Doctor? But if this new instrument does what I hope it will there'll be practically no limit to the speed of a rocket ship immediately upon taking off. Good night. Imagine getting into the control cabin, opening the power lever, and going a couple of thousand miles an hour just like that. That's exactly what we'll be able to do, Wilma. Boy, that hardly seems possible, does it? But uh, when can we test it out, Doctor? Have you already got it installed on a rocket ship? Uh, No, Buck. As a matter of fact, I I don't even have it yet. Huh? Oh, it's been made up all right. Uh, The one we use for the test, but... It isn't right here yet. I don't understand, Doctor. Well, yes, sir. Can't we get it here? The sooner we can get it and start trying it out, the sooner we can break the monotony of just sitting around here doing... Wait, Doc. Listen. Yes, Doctor. I hear it, too. Oh, yeah. Hear it? Yes, sir. But what under the sun is it? Look here, out of the window. Look, here's Wilma. And it's coming right down this way. Wilma! Buck's wish for excitement certainly came true in a hurry. Great day. I wonder what that was. I certainly hope he and Wilma and Dr. Hewer are all right. What do you say, Pete? Well, I know what would make me feel all right. A great big frozen fudgicle. Jiminy, can you imagine anything better than that fresh, creamy chocolate fudge, frozen ice cold on a stick? Fellas and girls, what's the best, purest, biggest nickel's worth you can get? Right, a fudgicle. Delicious and full of healthful energy. Made only from pure milk products. Swell to eat and easy to digest. And don't forget to save the bags for those wonderful free prizes. 
Exciting gifts like cameras, dolls, sweatshirts, gorgeous jewelry, and lots of other things. And listen, kids, be sure to get your free popsicle gift list at your ice cream store. Don't take no for an answer. <laughs> <laughs> 